Welcome to CardioSource World News. I'm Lisa Fletcher. Today we're talking with Dr. Bob Kocher, former special assistant to President Obama and a key architect of the Affordable Care Act. Dr. Kocher is now a visiting scholar at the Brookings Institution and a venture capitalist at Venrock. He's a frequent editorial contributor to the New York Times and the New England Journal of Medicine. Now, before serving in the White House, Dr. Kocher served as a principal at McKinsey & Company Management Consultancy. We're following up today on an interview that Dr. Kocher had in the July issue of CardioSource World News with Dr. Sachin Jain on his path from medicine to the White House and on the future of American medical care. Dr. Kocher, thanks for being here. Thank you. So, you were a chief architect of the health care reform. What kinds of things should cardiologists um, know about health care reform? I think they should know, first of all, that it will help them take care of patients. Uh, as a result of health care reform, virtually everybody will have high quality insurance that will allow doctors to do the care that they want to do without worrying about patients having excessive cost sharing or a lack of access to care. I think that's the first thing. I think the second thing is that it's going to actually roll out slower than they think. And so while there's a great deal of change coming over the next decade, it is literally over the next decade. And so they'll have time to prepare and adapt and to be comfortable, I think, with the changes as they come. Uh, the ACC supports a lot of the provisions um, of health care reform, but there are still some concerns primarily in addressing liability and payment reforms. What role can ACC play to sort of move those reforms forward? Well, I hope, I hope we can actually address uh, medical malpractice. It's an important area that hasn't been tackled yet. Uh, one of the reasons why it hasn't been tackled is that there's a lack of unanimity around what is the best answer. And different medical specialty groups had different perspectives on this, as do members of Congress and the public at large. And, and organized medicine can certainly do a lot to align around, you know, what are, what are the practical paths that get the balance right between protecting doctors and protecting patients uh, and agree. Because today when you go out to the medical community and ask, well, how do we fix it? Mm -hmm. You get a lot of energy to fix it, but you don't get a lot of alignment. And so whether it's health courts or caps or modified presumption for following clinical evidence or pre-trial review, It'd be great to have doctors say, okay, here's the policy we think works best, and also make sure it works best from the point of view of other stakeholders. Is this a call to doctors to get more involved politically? Um, I, think, I think so, and also to coordinate. Right now, you know, as a person who was on the receiving end of input from doctors, there's, you know, 30-odd specialty societies, there's the AMA, there's patient groups, uh, and, and they don't agree on what to do. And it made it very hard politically to figure out how to move forward without having a sense of, you know, what is the right policy. And there's been little tested, really, uh, across the country around these different areas. So there, there's ambiguity for how it's going to work. A lot of people, doctors specifically, have been talking about accountable care organizations. How should cardiologists be thinking about this? Well, I think they're pretty exciting. So accountable care organizations are really a way to reward doctors for coordinating care and giving better outcomes to patients that are saving money. And in ACOs, doctors will actually get some of the savings back that they generate through better care. Uh, what I like about it is that cardiologists are so integral in treating patients with CHF and CAD, that as they have better outcomes and patients use the hospital less and need fewer cardiac catheterizations and fewer echoes and have better control of their blood pressure, that's gonna save money and they'll get back some of that money. And there'll be greater demand by primary care doctors and others to have expert cardiologists help make sure that patients do better with these diseases that we know we can do better at. Very, very few people have read health care reform legislation from front to back. What do you think uh, doctors, specifically cardiologists, might find surprising within it? I think they'll find surprising how much money is going into R&D around how to improve the delivery system. One of the more exciting parts is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which is basically an $11 billion venture capital firm that can go out and test ideas and things that save money and improve quality. Medicare has the authority to bring to scale across the health system, that's never been able to be done before. You had to go back to Congress and pass a new law, and it took years. So this is a way to bring to scale things that work. They also have the power to partner with private payers. So one of the, new, one of the annoying things about being a doctor today is that every payer has their own program to try to reward you for better care with different quality measures and different payment systems. And that, that creates a lot of noise and not a lot of signal if I'm in practice. Now at least Medicare can join up with people who are doing programs in your state such that you'll have you know, you know, one program and you can really focus on it and hopefully change your practice in ways that reward you. Uh, many have suggested that the meaningful use of electronic health records is going to transform care. What do you see as an opportunity to improve care through health information technology? Well, I, I think we know from every other sector of the economy that as you create um, data and connections and the ability to actually use data to improve performance, you can get better productivity, 
better outcomes, more personalization, fewer errors, and it's frankly more fun. There's less paper flowing. And I, I'm very excited for healthcare, that health records and the fact that we can exchange data, we can view data, we can do all the cool things you can do with data is gonna make, frankly, being a doctor a lot more fun, a lot better, a lot less frictional with all the admin, um, and unleash a lot of productivity. If you look at how every other sector of the economy has benefited from information technology, healthcare's sort of yet to see that big improvement and I think we're on the cusp of it. A lot of different ways suggested to improve care delivery. What do you see as the most promising? I think the most promising one is actually the ability to have payment systems that reward doctors for sitting with patients and agreeing on treatment plans. And if those plans lead to better clinical outcomes and save money, that doctors can share in that savings. So the pressure to do more tests and procedures should, should diminish rapidly as we move to more of these shared savings programs. And I think patients will like it because it will be clear what we're doing and why we're doing it and what they have to do. And we all know that engaged patients who understand why, you know, what, they're, what we're expecting and, and, and when to call and, and how to access the system are, are, are better patients and, and do better. It, some may have suggested that previously doctors would do more tests to make more money. Now there's an incentive to do fewer tests to make money. Is that a concern at all? Well, I think the variation that you see in America is, is you know, eye-popping. Mm -hmm. And that variation exists in every market in the country. Um, it exists within every organization in the country. And you hope that it's because patients, you know, need it, want it, and, and are shared, are, are actually part of that decision-making. And, and the worry today is that in some cases that's not the case. The doctors actually have a, a true economic incentive to do more without it actually doing good for the patient. And in, in a world today where most patients are, are bearing 20, 30, 40% of the cost directly out of their pocket, it's really costly for patients. And so aligning reimbursement with what patients want and rewarding doctors for being more parsimonious, uh, I view as a very good thing. Unnecessary variation in reducing that so it's more likely evidence-based um, and patient-centered is also a really good thing. And so I hope that this leads towards more often use of data more often engagement of patients and doctors who don't have a, you know, either a conscious or unconscious concern that what they're doing is actually antithetical to their economic interest. Um, how can physicians influence the political process? Well, I think they're, they're, they're influential today. Mm -hmm. uh, groups like the ACC uh, were very active uh, in both the shaping of the legislation and refining the regulations and giving feedback in an ongoing way. Uh, many doctors from the ACC took part in many meetings, hearings, discussions, and so I think doctors are engaged. Uh, that said, uh, I think it's really helpful for doctors at the front line to make sure that, that the actual practicalities of policies are clear, that trade-offs are clear, and frankly, that if there's better ways to make the system work better for patients and be more, more affordable, to offer those up. Because people who make policy are seldom also seeing patients, you know, and, and it would be great to have more input. When, you know, physicians are physicians and they work within their world, when you jump over to policy, that's a, a totally different universe. For somebody that is now inspired to get politically active, what are the obstacles you think they're going to run into? Well, I think one of the obstacles is doctors tend to work through, you know, work as specialties, and it'd be better for doctors to work as doctors and to, and to align across specialties so that there's, you know, a physician perspective as opposed to lots of competing perspectives from doctors. So that would be one area where they can help. I think another is knowing you know, when to help. And so one of the best times to engage is actually when rules are proposed. There's a comment period, and those comments are read. I, I read hundreds and hundreds of comments on rules written in by you know, big organizations and individual doctors. And those comments are weighed heavily and actually do change policy. So I think that's one spot that probably is underappreciated where doctors can engage, where it matters, and, and where, uh, where it's practical for doctors to actually engage and, and share their experience. Dr. Coach, any final thoughts? Well, I think it's exciting, actually, to be a doctor. I think we're going to see more change in the next decade than we have in the last 20 or 30 years. And that change, which will be focused around making the system itself work more reliably, more affordably, and be more oriented on outcomes, is going to be a much more fun system to work in as a doctor. Because you're going to be focusing on achieving the best care you can, and you'll make your economics will actually work with you to do it. Uh, the use of technology is going to make it a lot easier to remember and do the right thing. And I think we're going to invent a ton of ways to engage patients in their care so that patients actually are sitting on your side of the table trying to also achieve the same outcomes and have the right incentives to do so. So I'm really excited about where we're heading. 
And we're really excited to have had you on. Thank you so much for taking the time to Thank be here. You. Dr. Bob Kocher. Be sure to read the full interview in the July issue of CardioSource World News or visit the publication online at www.cswnews.org.